I'm Brandi Cruz. Coming up today on Undivided, new polling shows that Washington voters are deeply unhappy with Democrats and Democratic policies. But will that be reflected in their votes? Plus, by now you have heard about the three GOP backed initiatives. We take you behind enemy lines in the initiative battle and the Washington lottery's really dirty AI fail. All that and more coming up today on Undivided. Remember, you can support our show for just five dollars a month by signing up at UndividedPod.com. Hello and welcome to Undivided. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your commitment to giving common sense a comeback. Do you feel it? Do you feel it? I feel it. Momentum is on our side. Now it's up to us to keep that momentum going all the way through November. And there are a variety of reasons I feel like momentum is on the side of team sanity. Uh, The story we did yesterday, criticizing our friends at Cairo Radio, who weren't too happy with that, by the way, um, defending Andrea Suarez because she's subjected to these crazy, relentless attacks Had we done that, had we defended her three years ago, we would have been lumped in with her and we would have been on an island defending the work she's doing. Not anymore. You should have seen the groundswell of support for Andrea Suarez online yesterday and the important work she's doing outside of the system. Uh, And so it's stuff like that where it's like, man, you know, we push back against things and where we used to be the only ones fighting the fight in the trenches alone. I feel like we got a whole army of of sane people who are in there in the trenches fighting with us. And it's a glorious thing. It really is. So I feel that way for for that reason. But also there are some more tangible things that really have me excited. You know, the initiatives uh, and the success of the initiatives is one of them. We're going to talk about uh, in a moment some uh, new polling in that regard. And then um, I think just the... uh, how do I put this? Like the the nature of the pushback we're getting on the show is relegated really to fringe far leftists, where it used to be like, you know, oh, Brandy this, Brandy's mega extremist, whatever it is. It's like reasonable people have stopped saying that. And now it's just the far left fringe crazies. So we're getting somewhere, people. We've got to keep up the momentum. I want to, um, this is breaking on our show. This is the first place you're going to hear about this. There's a new poll out from Echelon Insights, and it was um, paid for by Concerned Taxpayers of Washington. And Echelon, so they, Concerned Taxpayers certainly has a political bias or an agenda, which is to try to make sure that our tax money isn't being pissed away, which is amazing. Uh, but Echelon Insights, very reputable polling uh, firm, and so no reason to believe that this isn't uh, accurate to the best of their ability in polling. So just a few things before we get to the results of this that I want to go through. Um, And that's always how it was conducted, et cetera. So 600 registered voters in Washington state, 18 or older, were surveyed from March 18th to March 21st uh, using a mix of telephone calls and text uh, online. Uh, The sample was weighted to reflect the population benchmarks for the November 2024 registered voters for gender, age, race, ethnicity, education, region, party, da-da-da. So they try to make sure they have a well-rounded sample. Uh, And then the margin of error is plus or minus 4.7%. So keep that in mind. So when I got these, I will say my big takeaway is Washington voters are getting increasingly tired of Democratic policies and Democratic politicians. And the numbers now reflect that and increasingly so. So that's another reason why I'm just feeling excited that the momentum is on our side. So I'm going to go through a couple of these key takeaways from this poll. I'm going to save some of the polling on the governor's race for the show tomorrow, just not to overwhelm you with numbers, Uh, but a few things. So the simple question, is Washington state on the right or the wrong track? 32% in the polling said it's on the right track. 53% say it's on the wrong track. And um, as I'm going through this, there's obviously always going to be some segment of people who didn't know or undecided. And so if you see a discrepancy in the math that it doesn't add up to 100, that's why I haven't included the results for people who were undecided. So majority say we're, we're going down the wrong path. That's also reflected in the bad approval ratings for Governor Jay Inslee. In his final months in office, he is underwater by 10 points, 43 percent, saying they approve of the job that he's doing, 53 
percent saying they disapprove of the job that he's doing. So let's set this up. So now we've got, you know, people concerned about the state of Washington and the direction of things. You've got a sitting three term governor who is going to leave office with underwater approval ratings. And this kind of angst among the electorate is also uh, reflected in their desire, it looks like, to overturn some key Democratic policies. So this polling looked at the support or lack thereof for the three initiatives that are going to be on the ballot in November. And these are huge initiatives. There's going to be a lot of money spent trying to oppose them, but they are overwhelmingly popular. I know there's a big segment on the left that is going to hate to hear that, but these initiatives are overwhelmingly popular according to this polling. So let's go through it. So initiative 2124 to make the long-term care program optional. 65% of people polled support that change, that amendment to the current program. 22, 21% are opposed. 65%. Why? Because it's common sense. Hey, if I want to use it, then yeah, I'm okay paying into it. But if I don't want to use it, I don't want to have to pay into it. If I'm not going to benefit from the program, yeah, I think it ought to be optional. I don't want it to be a socialized program. 65%, that's huge. SEIU, the Home Health Care Workers Union, can't be too happy with those numbers. They also asked about repealing the cap and trade program, which, of course, is repealing this system that is raising gas prices at the pump by auctioning off carbon credits. This again. I can't imagine Jay Inslee's too happy with these numbers for his beloved Climate Commitment Act. 53% of people polled said they want to repeal the thing. 29% said no. 53%. That's, that is significant. I mean, there's a big segment that's undecided. And so there's going to be a lot left up to who fights a better fight between now and November. But uh, they're certainly not uh, uh, getting the results they want there. And then on the third and final one that's going to be on the ballot, in November, Initiative 2109 to repeal the capital gains tax. Now, this does not surprise me that this is the one that is going to be the closest, because I think it's the easiest sell for the opposition to say, oh, this is just about taxing really rich people. Why would you want to why would you want to get rid of that? Because they're going to help us pay for schools and all this stuff. But right now it's still doing better. Forty three percent say yes, they want to even with all that misinformation and fear mongering out there. Forty three percent say yes, I want to repeal it. Thirty eight percent say no. Now, one other thing I just want to throw in here and again, we'll we'll talk about some of the other poll results in the governor's race in particular. It's a very good poll for Dave Riker, perhaps the best one he's had to date. Um, but they did really something really interesting that I'm glad they did in this uh, polling is they asked about a um, hypothetical initiative to protect your right, the right of businesses to continue to be served natural gas. And this is a response to HB uh, 1589, which, as you know, basically puts PSC down this fast track toward not having to serve existing customers natural gas anymore. Now, they passed that bill with an emergency clause, which says that we can't just repeal it on a referendum. However, you could file an initiative that would actually go above and beyond repealing 1589. It would actually sort of codify that, yes, we want to be able to continue to have natural gas as an option for residential customers and also for business customers. So essentially the way this was worded is, you know, would you support an initiative to protect natural gas as an option? 77% said yes. 77%. Like if that's not a clear indicator that someone ought to jump on an initiative on that, I don't know what is. 77% is pretty good. I mean, good. don't you think They've that got to be. I mean, a lot of people have gas in their houses right? and they don't want to switch or they don't want to have that burden of switching. Yeah. So they're looking at it. And I was trying to see if I could find quick the really uh, the exact wording on that. Oh, yeah. Would you support or oppose a ballot measure that would ensure homeowners and restaurants can use natural gas for heating and cooking? 77 percent. Yep. Got it. Let's get that thing on the ballot. Let's get it on Because then, again, you, you just combine that with all these other things going on, and it seems pretty clear. So that is why I feel really good about the momentum that we have. And momentum has to be kept up. I mean, we can't just like, oh, what a good session for common sense. You know, three initiatives were passed during the session. Polls are looking good for Dave Riker. Polls are looking good for the initiatives. And just sit back and enjoy our summer in the sun. 
No, we can't just enjoy our summer in the sun. There's a lot of work to be done. And that's why on our daily subscriber poll, which I'll get to later on in the show, I had asked you guys basically, what are you doing? What are you going to do to keep up the momentum from now until November in terms of helping political candidates that you like, in terms of helping to support ballot measures or these initiatives? Uh, and look, I don't care. If you want to support a candidate that I don't support, you do you, 100%. I still want you to be actively involved and civilly, civically engaged in all of that stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, don't hang up a yard sign because it's not for a guy I like. No, you, you do you, and then we'll see who uh, comes out at the end of the day. But I think there's a lot of us in the common sense realm who want the same things. So anyway, with all of that in mind and you know our desire to continue up the momentum that we have, we've got to check in on the opposition. We've got to check in on team insanity, team no common sense, which is why we uh, were sent this podcast. It's an in indivisible podcast. Never heard of it, but it's a uh, popular podcast with progressives in Washington state. That's probably why I haven't heard of it. But anyway, um, they gave us an opportunity to go behind enemy lines to see what the arguments they're cooking up are against these initiatives. And I'll say um, they didn't disappoint. Their arguments are essentially what I thought their arguments were going to be. But I want to play for you. Here's how, here's how confident I am that their talking points are terrible. I'm going to, on my much larger podcast, to my much larger audience, play for you some of the talking points from their podcast that are op about opposing the initiatives. And I'm going to lift those up and play them here on my show because I'm so confident that their talking points are so bad <laughs> that they're just going to completely fall flat. Uh, so here's the intro to this particular episode, again, completely focused on what the progressive strategy is going to be for making sure voters reject these initiatives. By now, you have heard about the three GOP-backed initiatives on this November's ballot that are threatening to roll back important progress on things like the climate, health care, and equitable taxation here in the state. Our friends at Fuse Washington have been hard at work on messaging and strategy to help us defeat these measures. And here to talk about it are our friends Rosie Barber. She is campaign director with Fuse and Rainey Cohen, director of the Fuse Communications Hub. Hello to you both. How are you? Good. Hello, to be here. <laughs> All right, now you've met the cast of characters, so let's dive into this. And this was like 20 minutes of strategy. So again, behind enemy lines, let's see what they've got cooking up for us. That we oh, Should we be concerned? Do they have a really good game plan? Well, the first thing they started off with is how do we define? How are we going to try to label these initiatives? Let's talk first about how we want to brand these initiatives, because we know these GOP backers are calling their initiatives Let's Go Washington, which is kind of absurd on its face. So, Rosie, talk about how you would like people to refer to these initiatives as well as a campaign to defeat them. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. So as you mentioned, Brian Haywood's pack is called Let's Go Washington, which is kind of a play on words of the MAGA slogan, Let's Go Brandon. Um, oh, we'll, I hadn't put that yeah. together. Oh, they're so fun. Jeez. Yeah. Is that, do we have to keep going? Is that it's so fun? It's so fun. Is uh, is it a play on Let's Go Brandon? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, one of the things I really wanted to do is just put a montage together of all the times they said MAGA, because <laughs> mm -hmm. that is the central theme of their whole strategy to push back against these initiatives. Who knew Let's Go Washington was a, a, a spin on the phrase, let's go Brandon. Uh, let's keep listening in, shall we? So when we talk about the initiatives, we call them backwards initiatives because they aim to take us backwards and undo years of hard fought progress. Um, but the broader campaign is called Defend Washington. And that's kind of all about the fact that we all deserve to live in healthy communities. And these deceitful initiatives would harm our health, our schools, and our economy. Uh, and we know better than to fall for these lies. Um, so we're coming together to defend Washington and urge people to vote no on these initiatives so that we can protect our communities, um, the ones that we love and we built here in Washington. Oh gosh, where to start? Um, I love that their like genius branding is bat. We're, we're going to call these initiatives backward initiatives. It's like that's not very good. Our <laughs> chant is much better. Vote yes, pay less. I mean, that's easy. Way better. Backward initiatives. What is that? What is and that? Years <laughs> of years of work and progress. No, these are no. These are not and new. that's the other thing is if if their plan is to try to say that these initiatives will hurt progress in the state, will take us back years. Um, 
you know, we'll, we'll make the state less safe, less affordable or whatever it is. It's the complete antithesis about what all these initiatives have been about. I mean, one of the initiatives passed in the legislature, which was overwhelmingly popular and had bipartisan support, was to restore reasonable police pursuits. That's the kind of thing you do if you want to make the state, if you want to make the state safer. And if you want to make the state more affordable, as you're suggesting there, then these initiatives are what's going to do it. You guys have passed billions of dollars in new taxes in recent years. And this whole idea that it's going to take the state backward when you're talking about revenue streams that you just started collecting on a year ago is, is ludicrous. All right, let's keep going. What more should we know about who's behind these initiatives? Oh, God. Yeah, so Brian Haywood and Jim Walsh are kind of the villainous dynamic duo behind these initiatives. Uh, <laughs> Brian Haywood is a multimillionaire Republican mega donor. Um, he's the main funder of these initiatives. Uh, he spent upwards of $6 million of his own money to get these initiatives on the ballot. Uh, and he's basically trying to buy himself and his wealthy friends a tax cut. And Jim Walsh uh, is the other one in this dynamic duo. He is the far right Republican MAGA state party chair, and he is the prime sponsor of all the backwards Washington initiatives. Um, and you know, with a Democratic majority in the House and Senate here in Washington, uh, these two are basically trying to game the system through the initiative process uh, because Republicans can't win elections uh, there and they can't push their MAGA agenda through the legislature. Uh, they're using whatever means they have available to undo historic progress here in Washington. Oh, Lordy. Take a shot. How many times did she say MAGA in that one? I, got... I wasn't counting. Our shots of espresso, do they count? There you go. One. Two. Oh, it's... <laughs> That's too much. Three, three shots. So here's the thing. Well, that was all unhinged. But you notice she, they're just reading this from scripts. So they've got like their talking points. and They're sitting here reading these talking points, the same talking points that are, you know, being regurgitated by the state party chair and all of this. It's like, oh, mega this. He's an extremist. He's doing this for his rich friends. Republicans can't win elections. So they're gaming the system. How is this gaming the system? How is doing something very difficult be it, you know, initiatives and signature gathering. How is doing something very difficult that is allowed for under our state constitution that is a power the people in the state have, how is that gaming the system? Well, can someone explain that to me? You know, you had the House, uh, Speaker of the House, Lori Jenkins, who said it was really disappointing to see what the initiative process has become. What are you talking about? The initiative process is simple. You gather enough signatures, you can get something on the ballot and allow people to vote. So is it gaming the system to allow people to vote on it? Why is that gaming the system? Because they might vote against your policies? All right, do we got one more? Mm -hmm. I think we can get through one more. Go ahead. And you're doing those welfare checks. Uh -oh. Wait, what? Uh, Nicole. Well, that's not it. What happened? Nicole. You know, how many days? Nicole's fired. There you go. <laughs> okay, you got it? Do you feel like we talk about the potential harm these initiatives would cause? Do we appeal to people's values? Both, neither, something else? I mean, it's all of the above. When you're talking about the harms, you are actually appealing to people's values, right? If you think about repealing the capital gains tax and removing or eliminating $900 million from schools and childcare and just like student enrichments, that's a value that we all hold. And the damage that, that, is, that this initiative is going to cause is going to hurt us in our values. And so, you know, we, we want to package our messaging as always with like, leading with that shared value, identifying who the villain is, in this case, Brian and Jim, um, and then our call to action, which is obviously vote no on all of these initiatives. So um, as long as we are educating our voters about exactly what these initiatives will do and the fiscal impact statement that will appear on the ballot will help articulate that, um, and then pair it with the fact that um, this is also that a wealthy man from California can get a tax break for himself and his rich Reading friends. Your lines. And Reading so that your lines. Jim Walsh can advance the mega agenda in Washington because they can't Shut. do it legislatively. Shut. Mm -hmm. Exceptionally well put. Articulate just as you've done our shared value. Talk about the villains in the equation and then give a call to action. Absolutely textbook. I love it. 
you know what? I love it too. Because if this is the opposition, this is going to be a lot easier than I thought. I think we need to oh. paint them as heroes instead. So from now on, oh, yeah. hero, Jim. The villains. Hero, Yeah. If, Ryan. You, if, if you think people are so dumb, they're going to buy into your, these are villains narrative. I just don't know how to help you. But keep doing that. I posted on their video. I said, thank you for this. Because when I was watching it earlier, I was laughing so hard. I was crying because I was just thinking, wow, this is going to be much easier than I anticipated. Doesn't mean we don't have to put a lot of work in and continue to keep up the momentum. But if those are, if that's the uh, quote unquote enemy, then I think we're going to be just yeah. fine. All right. Coming up next, uh, Oregon has uh, officially um, signed, well, the Oregon governor has officially signed a law that will recriminalize drugs there. Their failed experiment uh, went wrong and they are now fixing it. So we'll talk about that in the context of maybe Washington state trying to do something similar. First, I've been talking about my success on the Eastside Weight Loss Clinic program. I really went off on a tangent about this yesterday, but not today. Uh, Because somebody on the internet called me fat and I got really upset because I am down almost 40 pounds on the Eastside Weight Loss Clinic program. Uh, And I've encouraged you guys, if you've been thinking about it, now is the perfect time to start because summer is coming up. I lost most of that weight in two months. Uh, And so you could see fantastic results. I mean, I lost 30 pounds in two months on the program. So April, May, by June, a lot of people lose 20 to 30 pounds in the first month or two. It's not magic by any means. Uh, It is a structured program that you do have to follow for 60 days in order to see those results. But the results are so wonderful and it happens so quickly. It really, really keeps you invested. So uh, eastsideweightlossclinic.com, eastsideweightlossclinic.com. You just start by scheduling your free 15-minute consultation with Dr. Ryan Coogan and his team and ask him any questions you have before you commit to the program. But I'm telling you, April, May, June, new year, new you, right? Exciting. Okay. New summer. You're looking at me weird, Nicole, like I've done something wrong. <laughs> no. I just to too hyped up on coffee today. (laughs) All right, so you guys, we talked about kind of the process leading up to this. So Oregon voters had actually decriminalized hard drugs. And as we know, that is a failed experiment and a lot of credit to the state of Oregon for realizing that and for saying like, that didn't work. And I think there were a few reasons for that that we'll get into that, that they realized, I think, the error of their ways fairly quickly. Uh, But this from the Associated Press, Oregon governor signs a bill recriminalizing drug possession into law. So she signed the law, uh, ending a first in the nation experiment with decriminalization that was hobbled by implementation issues. The new law rolls back a 2020 voter approved measure by making so-called personal use possession of misdemeanor, a misdemeanor punishable by up to six months in jail. It also establishes ways for treatment to be offered as an alternative to criminal penalties by encouraging law enforcement agents to create deflection programs that would divert people to addiction and mental health services instead of the criminal justice system. So I I like that. I think that's fine. It's not a felony or anything, but it's like, hey, you could go to jail if you don't get help. And that's what we all want. We want people to get help. We don't want them in jail. But uh, if they're not going to get help, then jail might just be the place for them to get back on their feet. Uh, The article goes on to say the law directed, so this is talking about the law that voters passed. It had directed hundreds of millions of dollars of the state's cannabis tax revenue toward addiction services. But the money was slow to get out the door and health authorities already grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic struggled to stand up to the new treatment system. At the same time, the fentanyl crisis began to spark an increase in deadly overdoses. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like they decriminalized it, which I think was a mistake, but it's what the voters of Oregon wanted. So they tried to do that, put money towards services. But like a government bureaucracy does, that just wasn't working. And and that's the thing that to me, if we had a robust system that was easily connecting people to services, they were apt to accept help and and we see that often they're not so if we had a system where people were like yeah if the help is available i'm gonna take it and then that system was there and you get him in and you do all that and it was working like a fine a uh, well-oiled machine then i think we'd be having a different conversation here about uh criminalization versus decriminalization but we know that's not the case we know that on the homeless front the mental health front the drug crisis that the government has failed that the industrial complex the bureaucracy and all of that has failed to get help in the hands of the people who need it quick enough to make a difference. So that's why this 2020 law failed. It really was in the implementation. It's this pie in the sky approach, like police defunding. You know, when police defunding came up in Seattle in 2020 and critics warned like, hey, you can't just defund the police without having all these alternatives that you say we want instead of police in place. Like 
fine, work toward getting the alternatives to policing and all these programs established. And then if you feel like you can defund the police a little bit, like, let's do it. Because I said at the time, police defunding is a is a fine idea if we live in a utopia. I would love to get to the place where crime levels are at a place where we can take money away from the police and put it into community programs to help people thrive. That's fine, but that's not reality. That's not the reality we're living in. And so you had 2020, all this highly ideologically motivated legislation and voters push this through in Oregon, but they're, they're backtracking. And that's what needs to happen. And I'm always going to be okay with people coming back to the land of sanity and common sense and saying, tried that, didn't work. People are dying. Now we need to make sure that we have a carrot and a stick. So good for you, Oregon. Good for you. And and Washington, in fairness, we did experiment with decriminalization for two years, but it was sort of a de facto experiment because the Washington State Supreme Court in the Blake decision nullified our state's felony drug possession statute as unconstitutional. So rather than just do a quick fix to it, uh, Democrats, you know, wanted to toy for, with, for, with decriminalization, de facto decriminalization for a couple years. And then at the end of last legislative session and into a special session, they did ultimately um, put a new law on the books, although it wasn't a felony, it was a gross misdemeanor. So we had our own sort of experimentation. It wasn't a law that was passed, uh, but it was just sort of this weird gap in time where people weren't being arrested for possession. And, and that was obviously very, very bad. So hopefully we would never go to the extent that Oregon did and pass a full-fledged law saying, hey, decriminalize this. Okay, uh, coming up next, can we show this picture? We can. Yeah. So the we Washington lottery system oh. had this weird AI game that people could participate in. Well, it turned into softcore porn. We'll have the story for our friend Jason Rance coming up next. First, Zach Abraham has been talking with us on the show about the state of the economy and how you have all these factors like the market just going gangbusters. But it's totally out of step with all these other economic factors that show us that the economy is not strong. You got the economy expanding at a supposed rate of about 3.2 percent. You got the government running 7 percent deficits. If you had if you had normal levels of deficits, two to three percent of the economy, you'd be in recession right now. OK, so the way we look at this, generally speaking, is I think people are looking at the stock market. I don't think that's what they should be looking at. Um, I think everything's going to continue to go up as long as we're running those deficits. Mm. The key is, is that. You have to also understand that you're in a falsified environment, meaning these things are not going up because they're worth more. They're going up because effectively the denominator is shrinking. Yeah. So if you're kind of confused by what do I believe, who do I believe about the state of the economy and how well protected my retirement is, uh, I really suggest just having a free know your risk portfolio review with Zach Abraham and his team at Bulwark Capital. This is what they specialize in, is managing your risk. It doesn't mean they're not going to try to make you money, obviously, but depending on what your risk tolerance is and how close you are to retirement and some of the factors in the market, they're going to make sure that your hard-earned retirement that you only get one of is well protected. So sign up for their uh, free risk review now at knowyourriskradio.com. That's knowyourriskradio.com. Investment advisory services offered through Trek Financial LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Investments involve risk and are not guaranteed. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All right, the Washington lottery in an effort to try to, I don't know, entice people into gambling so they could go on some sort of dream vacation. They set up this fun little AI thing on their website, and it ended up being softcore porn. Let's talk about it in our segment, Unbelievable. Boop. All right, a 50-year-old mom from Tumwater named Megan decided that she was gonna to toy with this new tool from the Washington Lottery that they put out just for fun. And basically it was like an AI powered app that said, hey, we want you to imagine yourself having a dream vacation, the kind of vacation you could only buy if you won the lottery <laughs> in Washington. You know, so it's like you could envision yourself there and then you're like, gosh, I really want that vacation. I'm going to go play the lottery. <laughs> and so in doing this, they said, just upload a picture of yourself. And then our little AI robots will put you, put you in a dream vacation. So Megan's like, why not? That sounds fun. 
<laughs> so she put her face in there, and this is what. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I like to do on vacation. You know, when I think of a dream vacation, <laughs> I think of myself kneeling topless on a bed surrounded by fish. <laughs> oh my God. So here is the backstory from our friend Jason Rance. I mean, she looks good. Well, my dream is to I mean, look that like, good. Yeah. Can I 100%? Like, if I looked that good topless, I might spend more time topless <laughs> kneeling on a bed on vacation. <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay. I'm sorry, Megan. I'm sure this was really distressing for you. So, <laughs> from our friend Jason Rance, the headline, Washington's lottery forced to pull site after creating AI porn of a lotto user. So, it goes on to tell the story of Megan. Visited this mobile site on March 30th. She thought she was in for some frivolous fun. Uh, it says test drive a win is what it was called. Allows users to digitally throw a dart at a dartboard featuring dream vacations you can pay for with the money you win in the lottery. Depending on where the dart lands, you can either upload a headshot or take one on your phone to upload. And the AI superimposes your image into the vacation spot. Megan says she used the inside option to take a photo of her face to upload. Oh, the photo that was created shows a smiling AI version of Megan, but almost completely nude. In the image, Megan is sitting on a bed with a bathing suit bottom on, but no top. Her bare breasts are exposed. The background of the image appears to show the bedroom in an aquarium with fish swimming around her. There is a Washington lottery logo in the bottom right corner. Quote, our tax dollars are paying for that. I was completely shocked. <laughs> it's disturbing to say the least. And Megan her, explained to the Jason Rand show. Her dart landed on mm -hmm. Sharks, swimming with sharks. Yeah, I think. so something like that, like her dream, dream vacation, vacation, swimming with sharks. And apparently AI translates that into kneeling on a bed, topless. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. So I, they don't know what happened. So basically Jason reached out to them like, what is this? <laughs> and they basically said that they had parameters in place that were supposed to say like no nudity. And I'm sure they had some other parameters. And for some reason, nudity appeared. And <laughs> they have no reason to believe that that this image is not authentic and was not created by their system. So they pulled, after Jason reached out to him, they pulled this, uh, what do they call it, test drive a win mm -hmm. thing offline. And I don't know if they're going to put it back online, but uh, yeah. I feel like who needs porn are hub? happen quite a when, bit. Who needs Pornhub when you have the Washington Lottery website? That's right. <laughs> I feel um, like with the I, – I think it's like the in next 18 months or something like that are supposed to be big for AI. And I think we're going to have a lot of these issues, right? If you're going to be the the <laughs> test driving of AI, you're going to end up <laughs> crashing and burning like this. Right. I just feel like how does that even happen? How does that happen when you're putting people in something as like, you know, oh, just a vacation spot, like on a beach or wherever it is, or swimming with sharks, and you wind up with a topless picture of this chick on a bed. I How does that happen? I don't know, because you would think that they were all pre-programmed. Like, okay, right. sharks is going to be in the water right. with sharks and uh, maybe a scuba suit or something. <laughs> I mean, so I, I'm telling naked. you, like, if I'm going to swim with sharks, I'm not going to be naked. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to be naked. Nope. Not going to oh, be naked. Oh, man. Megan, oh. that's hilarious. Can you try to get Megan on? Because I just okay. feel like that would be a lot of fun. Okay. I don't know. I'm sure Jason has her contact info. Nicole's like, why you would think we do Jason that? would share with me? <laughs> yeah, Jason. We're giving him credit. Yeah. He will. We'll, we'll guilt him. I'm like literally, <laughs> I, I, I am s snotting because uh -huh. I was laughing and snorting. So I'm pretty good. My oh my gosh. That's good stuff. Okay. Good we're going to get to a little national news. We do have to be out on time today, Nicole. So keep me on track. I've been mm -hmm. very off track. Um, all right. Before we get to some national news, you know, uh, you know what I did on my way, my drive in, Nicole? What'd you do? I had a nice little 15 minute phone call with First Mark Insurance. Okay. I took some time on my drive in because our plan is renewing. We're up, coming up on a year and I wanted to talk through some things with her. Had a couple things I wanted to change. She explained sort of everything that was going on with our policy. It was so pleasant. I can't even tell you. 
So pleasant. Uh, so I have just praised First Mark Insurance and encouraged every single one of you to take the First Mark Challenge like Mike and I did. The first thing is it costs you nothing. It costs you nothing to take the challenge and it costs you nothing to be a member of the First Mark family. All it is is you're gonna have an insurance broker in your corner to go out and do all the hard work for you when it comes to finding insurance, comparing policies and all of that. They're doing it all for you and they're gonna come back, explain it to you based on your needs and, and, and what you want. Maybe you needed better insurance. Maybe you needed to save a little bit of money. Uh, our friend uh, Eric in Woodenville, who watches the show, he emailed us his success story, he said that um, he was a little skeptical, like, why do I need someone else to help with my insurance? I've been doing it myself for this long uh, and feel like I do a pretty good job. But he did the first mark challenge. They saved him 30 percent on his auto policy and 70 percent on his homeowner's policy. He says, I now tell anyone I know who's dealing with changes to their insurance to give first mark a call. I did it and I'm truly richer for it. Eric, smart guy not only because you watch our show, but because you took the First Mark Challenge. FirstMarkInsurance.com, FirstMarkInsurance.com. The very best part is they work for you. All right, we got some Trump-related stories to get to. I feel like we haven't talked about old Donald in a while. Well, Donald's doing pretty well in the swing states. Talk about, you know, maybe momentum moving away from Democrats. Not a huge fan of Donald Trump, but it does not surprise me that he's doing uh, better given the state of the economy, what's happening globally, all of that, the disaster on our southern border. So uh, Wall Street Journal out with new polling that says Trump is leading Biden in six of seven swing states. So he's leading Biden in Pennsylvania, in Nevada, in Michigan, in North Carolina, in Arizona, Biden is up in Wisconsin, but just barely. Uh, and then Trump is leading Biden in Georgia. Or are they tied in Wisconsin? Yeah, they're tied in Wisconsin, 46-46. Obviously, there's a margin of error. So those are pretty good numbers for the former president. Obviously, swing states are a huge indicator uh, and a bellwether for sort of what might happen nationally. Now, we've talked a lot about polls on the show today. Are polls the end-all, be-all? No. The, you know the, the day that polls died for me? I was standing, I was a reporter for Fox 13. I was covering the 2016 election night returns from the Republican Party uh, headquarters election party. And I remember watching early in the night the little poll thing on CNN saying that Donald Trump had a 1% chance of being the president. And within two hours, he was the president. Right. He was declared the winner. Mm -hmm. And so that was the day polls died for me, where I'm like, uh, and I was actually pretty upset that night because I really, as a member of the mainstream media, despised Donald Trump. Been a little red-pilled and calmed down since. But uh, I was like, polls are nothing. But, you know, I, I think some pollsters have learned lessons from 2016 that have helped in, in polling accuracy. But then when you see something that feels very overwhelming like this, it's like, OK, you got to look at that. And the Biden team should be looking at that and being very concerned. Now, speaking of Donald Trump, <clears throat> remember we talked about, was it last week, the bloodbath thing with Donald right, Trump? a couple weeks ago, yeah. Where he said that um, he was talking about the auto industry. Very clearly, his remarks in context, he was saying that if he's not president, it's going to be a bloodbath for the auto industry because they're going to send all this to Mexico and whatever it is in China. And he's not going to do that. But the media took oh, it, out of context and said, Trump said there's going to be a bloodbath if he doesn't win. <laughs> which is just crazy. It's so unjournalistic where we've gotten. So now there's another example of that. So now all over the place, there's headlines saying Donald Trump thinks migrants are animals. Let's listen to what Donald Trump had to say. The 22-year-old nursing student in Georgia who was barbarically murdered by an illegal alien animal. Uh, the Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans. I said, no, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. Nancy Pelosi told me that. She said, please don't use the word animal, sir, when you're talking about these people. I said, I'll use the word animal because that's what they are. Yeah. And so when I listen to that, to me, it's very clear he's talking about, in that instance, an illegal immigrant who murdered someone. So illegal immigrants who are coming into the country, committing laws and hurting people. That seemed pretty clear to me. And if it didn't seem clear, it certainly wasn't an outright, oh, he's calling all immigrants animals. There's just, I don't see how you could frame it that way. But and, the media finds a way. And when he references talking to Pelosi about it, that's back when he called MS-13 animals. Yes. And 
they had done the same thing correct with right and msn ms13 they are animals mm -hmm. you see what they do to people i mean they butcher people so anyway he's clearly talking about violent dangerous people when he says animals but uh if you read most headlines today in the mainstream news you would think that he called all migrants animals just a few of the headlines donald trump says he thinks some migrants are animals and not people Trump escalates his dehumanization of migrants. Some are not people. These are animals. Reuters, animals. Trump um, ups rhetoric on illegal immigration. Even Newsmax, which I was like, why is Newsmax doing that? Trump calls migrants animals in Michigan stop. Blah, 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 blah. All these headlines like that. Uh, and here, of course, is how the mainstream media covered it. He's calling immigrants animals. Call uh, migrants animals. Calling um, undocumented migrants animals. Calling immigrants animals. About migrants. Calling them not human. Not all immigrants are animals like he called them today. Like that's an incendiary statement that's just so divisive and so hateful that it's just it's kind of hard to understand what's happening. Okay. <laughs> it is kind of hard to understand what's happening with the news media. I will say I'm going to give one CNN correspondent Scott Jennings credit for how he responded to a question about this from Wolf Blitzer. But when he says these uh, these immigrants are animals, they're not humans. What does that su suggest? I mean, isn't that brutal? Shouldn't people be condemning that? I listened to the entire tape. He was specifically talking about the person who murdered Lakin Riley in Georgia. And to be honest with you, Wolf, if somebody murders another human being, I think they deserve to be called animals. And I don't think any American uh, is really going to reject that kind of rhetoric. That poor girl was murdered in cold blood. Is that person who did it not an animal? I think that's an apt term. So you think he was only referring to those murderers, not referring in general to illegal immigrants who are coming into the United States? I listened to the tape. That's exactly what he was talking about, in my opinion. Yeah, and I should clarify that he's not a CNN correspondent. He's a Republican commentator for CNN. And so he certainly has a bias. But as he's told Wolf, I listened to the whole tape. And this is what I thought he articulated. And so even if, can you play the Trump clip again? Can you play it again, Nicole? The 22-year-old nursing student in Georgia who was barbarically murdered by an illegal alien animal. Uh, the Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans. I said, no, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. Nancy Pelosi told me that. She said, please don't use the word animal, sir, when you're talking about these people. I said, I'll use the word animal because that's what they are. Yeah. And look, he, I think that a reasonable person could watch that and say, gosh, I wish he had been a little more clear that he's not talking about all illegal immigrants that he's talking about. I can see that. But the way that the media handles it is 100 percent rush to the worst possible interpretation of it, of everything he says. They rush to the worst possible interpretation of it, and then they treat it as fact. Like, this is how he meant it. All those headlines. This is how he meant it. That some, that, that, that migrants aren't human, that they're animals. Whereas you could have a reasonable thing and said, Trump appears to, you know, call, he called them uh, animals in this context. What did he really mean? Let's reach out to his statement, his, his uh, campaign for comment, whatever it is. But they will always jump to the worst possible interpretation of every single thing that man says. And it just gets old, honestly. It's, it's old. People are tired of it. They want to hear about policies. They want to hear about what the candidates are going to do to fix the country and help improve the economy and, and secure the southern border. They don't want to sit here and have this whole, oh, tit for tat on, oh, what did Trump say? What did he mean? All this stuff. It's, it's so exhausting, frankly. Uh, okay, uh, before we get to questions, comments, and our daily subscriber show poll, I have encouraged you guys, uh, if you're thinking about selling your home at any point this year, Get a jump start on any improvements that need to be done to it. Make sure that you have everything ready to hit the market when the Fed drops interest rates. So our friend Wes Jones with sellwithwest.com, um, he, you know, is also waiting on the Fed to drop interest rates because it will certainly improve the housing market. But we asked him what would happen if the Fed decides not to drop rates. If they stay where they're at right now, I actually think that values will stay closer to where they're at. We'll, be, we'll see lower appreciation. We'll see appreciation, but it'll be modest. But if they start to come back down, well, that's when I think we'll start to see more of the multiple offer situations and the bid ups in home sale prices. Yeah. So the very best thing that you can do is just be ready. Be ready. If you're going to sell your home at any point this year, get in touch with our friend Wes Jones, sellwithwest.com, sellwithwest.com. Ask him for a free market analysis. So you can kind of see how well uh, positioned your home is, depending on where it's at, et cetera. And then he can talk to you about their listing boost concierge service. So they can come in, make cosmetic updates to your home. They can even help pay for it up front. And then that way, day one, 
rates drop, you're ready, and you're ready to take advantage of all that uh, rush of demand. So sellwithwest.com, a better way to sell your home. All right, before we get to some questions and comments, I did ask you guys in our daily subscriber show poll what your level of participation is going to be ahead of the November election. And I think it's just a way to try to encourage everyone to be thinking about, okay, what am I going to do, right? Uh, so I asked, with an important election ahead, do you plan to get involved in helping candidates or a ballot measure? If so, how? By donating money, volunteering your time, spreading the word, putting a sign in your yard. I like Patreon for these because it lets you select multiple options. Uh, so there were a lot of people who said the primary thing that they're going to do is spread the word, which is something easy that we can all do, right? You tell your friends, you talk to your friends, and you talk to your family. You take any opportunity you can to engage your neighbors who might not be as aware of these issues that our state is dealing with to engage them in conversation about it. Talk to them about the initiatives. They're going to be bombarded bombarded with misinformation. And if they're not seeking out sources to confirm that information, they could believe some of these things that are being said. So 100% spreading the word is a really great, free, takes you know relatively no time way to help you know on this path toward common sense. Um, let's see, Jackie said, I don't do yard signs. My schedule is chaotic and I'm not sure about giving money because I don't need to be on another list where I'll be spammed to death. However, I'm happy to talk and have talked with people. It's a very important election. There's so much extra stuff. You got to do your research now and listen to Undivided. Yes, good advice. And find good political commentators who have their opinion, but bring on people that differ so you can get more grounded perspectives of what's going on. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Matt says, I have a Reichert sign in my yard and that will stay up. I need to talk to people face to face about the issues. I'll, I would donate money, but between Bidenomics uh, ignored super chats and that campaigns keep hitting you up after donating like a crackhead. I can't do it. Matt, we're sorry we ignored your super chat. We did come back on at the end of yeah. yesterday's show. I wonder if he, he stayed on long enough to see that we came back on yes. and read his super chat. Let me see. Uh, Julie says, my neighbor has a Bob sign. Now I need to get a Dave sign. Yeah, you got to have that competing stuff. Uh, Ron says, I'll continue to post my beliefs via social media. Uh, I would also post a Reichert for governor sign if I had one. Yeah, we got to get more of those out and about there. How can we easily get signs? Jennifer says, and I don't care who your sign is. If you want a Bob Ferguson sign, if you want a Mark Mullet sign, if you want a Semi Bird sign, I if mean, you want a Dave Reichert sign, well, maybe not a Bob yeah, sign. I probably won't help you get one of those. You can get one of those on your own. And actually, we'll only help you get the Dave ones. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I'm not going to help you get... <sighs> Well, you, you know did. what? <laughs> All you do is you go to their website, whoever it is, you send them an email and you request a yard sign or ask where you can pick one up and they'll be able to connect you with that. Kathleen says, I've already donated to campaigns, spread the word in, uh, in person and on my Facebook page and I plan to volunteer. I think that's great. Uh, okay, we'll get to some quick questions and comments. We might have to skip sanity check today. We've got a duck out on time today. Uh, let me see here. <clears throat> Why am I so <clears throat> phlegmy today? <laughs> Shelly says, I just love your enthusiasm and action, Brandy. Helps me stay positive about the state of our state. You should be positive, more positive than perhaps we've ever been about the direction of things. Baron of Gray Matter with a $5 super chat. Uh, sorry, 4.3 million of 7.8 million people live in Puget Sound region. 32% approval is 1.7 million voters. Lefties own Washington. They do. However, historically, anti-tax initiatives and measures have done pretty well statewide because, you know, you don't have to, like, if you're in Seattle, vote for a Republican, God forbid, but you might be feeling the crunch and feeling the pressure and more apt to, to vote to repeal a tax, et cetera. So I, I am actually not surprised by the numbers for the initiatives because, and it's going to depend on, obviously, how it all appears on the ballot and, and the anti-campaign and how honest or dishonest people are. But that's what we're here for. All right, Bill Biz with a $20 super chat. Have you noticed how the mainstream media always tends to describe the initiatives as GOP backed or conservative backed? Yes, and that doesn't surprise me because the media is also more quick to label things in general when they come from the right. Like you see the phrase right wing used far more often in the media than you ever see left wing. When's the last time that you saw the media label something left wing or far left instead of far right? And I don't know why, well, I do know it's a bias, but again, they rush to the right wing thing. And then, but when you have like actual like bona fide socialists in Seattle pushing policies, they don't say left wing 
defunding debate or anything like that. So it's not a surprise that they always want to make sure to label it GOP backed, conservative backed, because it's that internal bias of theirs where they don't label all the other stuff like Democrat backed, you know, left wing backed. It's just weird. It's weird. Baron of Grey Matter with another $5 super chat. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other from John Adams. It's a good John Adams quote. H, $5 for the snort jar. I had a doozy of a snort today. That was like a $10 snort because it was deep, you know? It's really deep. It was a good laugh. I mean, come on. Softcore porn created by a government AI program. It's amazing. Uh, Andy Stevens, a dollar says none of them watched his statement. Oh, uh, Donald Trump's statement. The, yeah. I mean, Wolf obviously hadn't. I mean, he he doubled down on it, and it's like, right. oh, so you think he was saying that? He's like, I know he was. <laughs> yeah, I listened to the whole tape. I listened. Captain Cranky Pants, the more they attack Trump, the more I support him. I, I agree with that in the sense that the more they attack Trump, the more my brain says, why? Why are they so rabid about these things? And then you look at what else they're distracting from, right? Um, Todd Welch, Trump is so inarticulate. He opens himself up to these types of criticism. He cannot continue to give mainstream media these sound bites. I agree that Trump is actually very inarticulate. He's got his own style of speaking. Um, I think that's one of the, the the reasons people find him charming, I guess, for lack of a better I phrase, think it's is they like his strategy. Well, yeah, strategy, a hundred percent it's strategy. Mm-hmm. Um And I think that that's one of the reasons people find him accessible or relatable, even though he's this super rich guy, like trust fund child, essentially, who usually wouldn't be the the person you'd think would be relatable to like working class Americans, but he's worked hard to make himself relatable. Um, And, you know, he does have a style of speech that the media always has freaked out about. Like, oh, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And so they take him very literally at anything he says. And again, they jump to that worst possible interpretation. Right. Well, I think most people would say, you know, oh, I hope I don't get taken out of context or, oh, I hope I don't get misunderstood. But instead, he's like, you know, do what you want with my words. You know what I mean. Yeah, 100%. And 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 as opposed to Biden right now, who says things that nobody knows why he says. Right. And also... Yeah, and that's fair. Biden says a lot of wild stuff and he doesn't get any sort of criticism. Right. And his, I mean, because they're thinking Trump's is like mean and nasty and vicious mm-hmm. and Biden's is just like unhinged and doesn't make any sense, which mm-hmm. is just, just as age. dangerous, just right? Age. It's just his age. Just so, Biden. Yeah, Trump's not very articulate. He says a lot of crazy stuff, but I also talked about on the show previously, and this is a complaint I had when I was in mainstream media. If you go balls to the walls on every single thing he does and says, and it's like, oh, it's the biggest scandal ever, mm-hmm. people just ignore the real scandals. They're just like, oh, well, you've been, going crazy, losing your ever-loving mind about this man for what? Nine years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Do a little math there. And so it's like now you just get numb to it. It's like the phrase racist. You call every single thing racist. And then when there's real racism, people are just like, I'm so over you. I, I can't even handle you anymore. So that is the effect that it's having. And I don't think that's a good effect. I absolutely think Trump has done things very worthy of criticism from the news media. But it's just the plethora of constant bombardment, and it it absolutely drowns that stuff out, which I do not think is a good thing. The media loses its effectiveness when that happens. Uh, Okay, are we on our closing sanity check? I think we have time to get to it quick. Yeah. Oh my gosh, let's do it. Closing sanity check. So I'm sure you heard um, that one of the officers who was acquitted in the death of Manny Ellis has now been hired by the Thurston County Sheriff's Department. Uh, It was first announced in a post on Sheriff Derek Sanders' Facebook page uh, where he welcomed him as a lateral patrol deputy. It was, um, I'm sorry, Nicole, which one was it? Now I don't see it. Oh my gosh, hold on. Hold on. Nicole's um, supposed to put notes in for me. Oh, Which one geez. was it? Um, it is... <laughs> oh, Deputy Burbank. Okay, Burbank. sorry. Christopher Burbank. Deputy Burbank, one of the officers who was acquitted in the Manny Ellis death. So he has become a lateral patrol deputy with the Thurston County Sheriff's Office. And obviously some of the media are losing their minds about this. Um, and, and I am surprised any of them want to continue to be police officers, frankly, given what they were put through a political prosecution for a murder after having already been cleared in several investigations. Uh, but I wanted to play in particular some of the reporting from Cairo 7 News, which they couldn't get Sheriff Derek Sanders to comment. He wouldn't like do an interview with them. He put out just some sort of statement. So in lieu of that, they went out to the streets 
and asked people on the streets what they think about it. I guess I'd have to have more facts to know more than, you know, I just can't make a judgment off of just what the news says, the media, no offense. I didn't know he did that, but I think it's a great decision because I don't think they were guilty. The facts that I saw, the facts that I saw, they were not guilty. Uh, that's a no-brainer. He shouldn't. Ain't no way he should be uh, hired for that position. That's Even though he fair. was found not guilty? Even though he's found not guilty, but is that the truth behind all of it, though? The yeah. lawyer for the Ellis family says when he first heard the news, he thought it was an April Fool's joke, but he isn't laughing. Oh, God. Man on the street interviews are so worthless. When I was in news, I refused to do them. And it's not that I don't care what random people think, but you're basically having a reporter who goes up to someone. I don't know how she articulated the questions and, and articulates it in a way. And that's sometimes the only information they have. You heard that first woman who said, I, I guess I need more information to make a judgment about whether he should continue to be a patrol deputy. But here's the thing of all this hand wringing in the media. He was found not guilty. He was acquitted. Like, should he never be able to support his family doing the profession that he's trained to do ever again. He not only was he found not guilty at trial, he wasn't charged or found of wrongdoing in, in two separate police investigations. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't see any reason in the world why a police department, a sheriff's office would not hire him to continue to go about doing his job. Actually, I just so three minutes ago or oh. eight minutes ago now, uh, there was a press release from Derek Sanders put out that says, today I met with Deputy Burbank and discussed the impacts of his employment at our agency. At the end of the discussion, Deputy Burbank resigned his position. What? And it was accepted. That is so... That just happened? Sad, yes. Wow, that's really disappointing. That is so disappointing. We're Can you read the full to... press release? It's very long. Well, uh, you want when to I forward made it to me quick before we get off the air, I know we got to go. go on when time. I made the decision to hire Deputy Burbank, I failed to consider the greater community impact, and instead made the decision based on business needs to remedy uh, Thurston County Sheriff's Office staffing crisis. Furthermore, I entirely misjudged community perception on the investigation and jury process that Deputy Burbank completed. I recognize the harm that this has caused and to marginalized communities and I was wrong. I mean, this it is goes Sheriff on. Derek Sanders. Yes, but remember he did this before. Sheriff. What? We Here, I thought this was like a sane sheriff. Remember before he like endorsed a school board candidate, then people got mad at him and he took the endorsement yes, back and we shamed him for it. How could you <laughs> not? I'm sorry, Sheriff. You know, I like you, but how could you not anticipate what the community and, and by community, we're talking about a small segment of the community and the media that's that's going to be pushing all of that through. How could you not anticipate that? How could you not anticipate that in hiring an officer who was just cleared of a murder charge? And so this is, this has to be, and it is just a response to community pushback. Mm -hmm. But I would ask you again, how widespread is that? You always have a small segment of the community that's going to create a lot of noise. And do you listen to them? Or do you stick with your initial instincts and say, hey, this is a, a, a patrol officer who has experience. We can lateral him. He was found not guilty or whatever it is. So this is incredibly disappointing. And yeah, we just found about, out about that. Nicole just got a thing. Did, was somebody saying in the chat that he was fired? or No, did you... I just happened to have the page up still. And Crazy. That's insane. Wild. Uh, that's really disappointing. We'll reach out to Sheriff Sanders uh, and talk to him about that decision making. But look, again, what else do you want of this person? They were prosecuted by an attorney general who had a vendetta, who has a record of unsuccessfully prosecuting police officers. They were cleared of wrongdoing. And he can't move on with his life because the media wants to continue to hound him and because activists want to continue to, who already hate police, by the way. People who, you don't have to have gone to trial for murder as a police officer for a particular segment of our society to hate you with every fiber of their being and to question every single thing that you do. So is this who we're going to give in to now? And he can, what, never make a living for, as a police officer for his family? Under the eyes of the law, he's innocent. He, it, wasn't just a, it wasn't just a push, right? It wasn't just a hung jury or something. He was found innocent. He was found innocent. And now you're going to do this. And that's, that is, uh, I've never, I, I might be the most disappointed I've ever been in someone who I had a lot of I know we hope really, for. We really like him. And I thought he had learned after the first time. You don't listen to these, you don't like, listen to the few mob. ridiculous 
Uh. Because the mob's never satisfied. The mob's never sati satiated. And that's what I said at time about Sheriff Sanders. And I know he's kind of new to this or whatever it is, but that mob, they will continue time and time again to come after you. And now they know you're weak. And now they know you're weak. And now they know you'll bend because you've done it not once, but twice. And, and this might be really genuinely, you feel like you made a miscalculation and you made a mistake, but that's the kind of thing that needs to be considered before you do it. All, all the cards are on the table. You know 100% what the reaction is gonna be in a state like this when you hire a patrol deputy who was just cleared of murder. The fact that, that those calculations wouldn't have been made and once you make the decision, you're ready to stand beside your, beside your decision. So this is a huge, huge just miss and miscalculation. So we will absolutely follow up with this on the show tomorrow. We'll talk about it off the top of the show. How does that sound? All right, that has been it for today's episode of Undivided. That was going to be our sanity check. Turns out it's an insanity check. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your commitment to giving Common Sense a comeback. If you've not signed up to support our show already, please do so. UndividedPod.com. UndividedPod.com.